So the development of thymocytes occurs by a series of distinct steps. These are characterized by T cell receptor gene rearrangement. First we're going to do beta and then gamma and delta kind of are together in this context. Uh, proliferation and expression of both CD4 and CD8, so we go ahead and call them double positive because they have two positives on them. And then T cell receptor gene rearrangement happening for the alpha chain and then further for uh, gamma and delta. We'll talk about the significance of that later on. But expression of various combinations of cell surface markers reflect the state of the T cell maturation. So this is a diagram that I love because it's really uh, honest and straightforward about it. So a common double negative T cell progenitor, so it's a CD34, so it's a still a stem cell at this point, is going to give rise to alpha and beta uh, or, and, or um, a delta gamma. So here we have it's starting to develop into a T cell progenitor, so notice the CD2 there, and at this point one or two things are going to happen. It's going to essentially have a, a race of who can can rearrange their genes faster the beta chain or the gamma delta chain at the same time so they're, they're gonna have this race and whoever wins first gets to send a signal to shut down the others um, nine times out of ten the beta chain is going to win because the beta chain is yeah just one whereas delta gamma is two but if by the grace of God delta gamma does win then we have ourselves a delta gamma T cell that's going to develop all the way and, and, and ultimately leave, and there's no selective processes there for anything like that. Um, but for if the beta chain wins, which is more likely to happen, it ends up becoming a double positive thymocyte, which we see here, right? And then there's a second race between the alpha and then the gamma delta chain again are going to race each other, and then nine times out of ten, yeah, the alpha chain rearrangement's gonna happen before the delta gamma, and if delta gamma does happen, it becomes a committed T cell, to, to becoming a delta gamma T cell, sorry. It's gonna go off into the tissue space and just screw the selective processes here. But if it's an alpha, it wins, which it most likely will. It becomes a double positive T cell, or thymocyte if you could think of it, and this is gonna undergo select selective processes here. So. That's what we just kind of talked about there. So successful rearrangements of the beta chain signals the delta gamma chains to stop rearranging, and then successful rearrangements of the delta gamma chain signals the beta chain to stop rearranging. So you're not going to have, we can have CD8 and CD4 on the same thing, but we're not going to have alpha, a gamma, I'm sorry, alpha beta and then delta gamma T cell receptors <laughs> present at the same time. That's, that's pushing things a little bit too far. So as you can see here, the double negative T cell starts to rearrange their beta and gamma and delta loci, but the beta is just one, whereas these guys are two. So, yeah, he's going to reassemble himself faster, usually. But let's just say, so the beta chain genes rearrange, a pre-T cell receptor is going to sig assemble. Signal transductions are going to signal through, sorry, the pre-T cell receptors stop rearrangement and induce proliferation and expression of CD4 and CD8. Cool. Um, whereas the other one, if the ga gamma delta wins, we stop rearrangement of the beta chains and then we're going to progress and develop into that. And what's interesting to me is that these things leave the thymus immediately and they're going to immediately migrate to peripheral tissues. Whereas with these guys, we have some selectivity to, to undergo for them. So the delta gamma T cells exit the thymus without further development. Um, they are double negative cells, right, because they didn't have the rearrangement of the alpha chains, which is necessary to kind of start that whole uh, CD4 and CD8 production processes here. They're not MHC restricted because of, we talked about what they're, where they were located at, when, I think in the barriers video, or maybe sometime we talked about T cell receptors themselves. They have a very limited receptor repertoire. Production of delta gamma T cells dominates during early embryogenesis. And this also makes me also think that they are, I said also twice, but they are vestigial structures that they came before the alpha beta ones. But they populate the skin uh, and, and all the barriers work pretty well. Um, occupies less than, or approximately, sorry, 3% of the circulating T cells in the adult. Majority of those being found in the barriers themselves. So although they are functionally different, um, structurally, uh, and functionally, they're structurally different, they have a common uh, precursor that they came from, and they even have somewhat of a homology between them. This is why I really think that they're vestigial. So here we see the alpha chain and then the delta chain. Um, 
it located in between that. And so this is going to be very significant when we talk about recombination, that the alpha chain loci between the V and J segments of this is the delta chain loci. Um, but this is both happening on chromosome 14, and then on chromosome 7, we have uh, the beta chains here, and then the gamma chains loci as well. So um, the more frequent outcome is obviously for the beta chain to be produced before functional gamma delta because, yeah, he's faster. And in this situation, the beta chain assembles with a surrogate chain known as PTA, pre-T cell receptor, I guess is what we're abbreviating that for. And expression of this pre-T cell receptor on the surface halts all rearrangement. Um, this is also, if you can think of it as what this is analogous to, is the uh, surrogate light chain that we had for B cell development. We're testing here to see if the beta chain, which is homologous to the he uh, heavy chain in immunoglobulins, if this is going to be able to bind with a light chain, an alpha chain in this context, um, it's surrogate alpha chain, right? And then if it does, then it's going to uh, halt all the rearrangement that's going on uh, of the alpha, or, I'm sorry, of the gamma delta, and then proliferate into expressing both CD4 and CD8. And that's what these pictures are kind of uh, reiterating with the co-receptors of the CD3 here. Uh, it doesn't show CD4 and CD8, but anyways. Um, this rearrangement here we see that it has multiple attempts that can be made as well, and then the transcription of functional messenger RNA. So a functional pre-T cell receptor has the ability to form something called a superdimer. In other words, each functional heterodimer serves both as a receptor, both as a receptor, and as a ligand, which is crazy to me. Two functional heterodimers forming a superdimer generates the intracellular signaling through the CD3 complex, causing beta, gamma, and delta gene rearrangement to stop. And then the thymocytes passing this checkpoint are now called pre-T cells and are allowed to move to the next stage of development. I love the picture here of the superdimer and then the pre-T cell receptor with, with the associated CD3 uh, complexes that are going to send out the signals for them. So the next thing that happens is the cells are going to begin rearrangement as the alpha of the alpha chain, sorry, as well as reactivation of gamma and delta loci. I really feel like this is just a vestigial structure here and vestigial process as well. But the rearrangement of alpha chain always deletes delta whether or not it's productive. Why? Because if we were to think way back to when we learned about uh, somatic recombination, this part here, the delta chain, this is going to become our signal joint, whereas the V and J are going to come together to form our coding joint. So the signal joint memory that gets excised and doesn't get re replicated with it. So this is going to be removed, right? So given the large number of J genes, 61 of them, multiple attempts can be made for the productive rearrangement of alpha chain, right? So alpha chains are not nearly as, as uh, they don't have as high a casualty rate as we saw with beta. Um, but cells that fail to reproduce this, to, to produce a productive protein, sorry, are going to die by apoptosis and then be eaten up by the macrophages. So rearrangement of an alpha chain gene always eliminates the linked delta chain. A loci, you can see this here, this would be the coding, the signal joint here and this right here is the coding joint. And we have to remove that in order to, to have the appropriate uh, somatic recombination. So they're expressing a functional alpha-beta receptor are going to continue to develop in the thymus and then they're going to ultimately divide off into CD4 and CD8 positive T cells undergoing both positive and negative selection in the thymus. And this, this diagram here, I really like it because it shows all of the surface molecules and all of the functions that we have that are going on there and then the points in which the time in which they're present. For example, Icarus and GATA3 transcription factor are present throughout the entire processes. The POC is only whenever we have double positive. This is this right here is going to be kind of the source of my map, so if you, you're wondering where I'm getting this from. Um, we have rearrangement taking place, signaling RAG12, TDT, um, pre-cell uh, surrogate light chain, or surrogate alpha chain, sorry, uh, ZAP, CD3, LCK, all these stuff that are, that are going to come into play of that. So uh, here we see a picture showing just the, the processes here. This is the development of the alpha beta cell, alpha beta T cells in the thymus. So we have progenitor cells entering through venules. They're going to interact with the epithelia to start undergoing lots of proliferation through the stromal cells. We talked about that already. They're double negative T cells that are going to commit to a lineage. 
Um, then they have the first race between alpha, uh, between beta, sorry, and delta gamma. We're going to make the assumption here that beta wins because it does for the most part. And then we're going to have a checkpoint for it. We're going to make sure that that beta is, uh, chain is helpful and that it's going to be functional. And we do this boy with a surrogate alpha chain. And if it passes that test, then it's going to undergo uh, more proliferation and start to produce an alpha chain. And if that alpha chain is functional, we're going to test for it, if it's going to be able to form a bond with the beta chain. And if it's functional, then it's going to develop even further into mature double positive cells, which we're going to undergo the next step. And here, I guess, if I were to just draw the next step, would be selection is going to happen. And we're going to see how, this, how that, that works here. Three stages that I think are important to mention. There's the double negative stages, double positive stages, and lastly, and I'm probably not going to talk about it too much in this, is the single positive stages, and that's, that's really late in the game here. Okay, so for double negative, um, this is where we have a stem cell that has become committed to becoming a T cell. It's a T cell progenitor, and the first thing that we have that's happening is beta gamma delta recombination. But in this, it's basically, like we said earlier, that we have beta recombination is going to be in a race with alpha, uh, delta gamma. Gamma, I think gamma delta, I don't know if that's the, the order of it works. Um, recombination. And if the beta guy, the beta chain, which wins, which it usually will, um, we're going to have stop. It's going to release a signal that's going to cause a stop, the recombination of gamma delta. We're then going to further develop into making a pre-T cell receptor. And this pre-T cell receptor consists of a surrogate alpha chain known as PTA. And this right here, this is a checkpoint. This is a testing, right, to see if this is um, a functional uh, beta chain, right? So if it's functional or is it non-functional. So if it is functional, then what's going to happen is it's going to these pre-T cell receptors are going to start to dimerize and start to form dimers, super dimers in certain contexts. And this is going to give us signaling. We're going to shut off the beta, gamma, and delta gene rearrangements. It's going to shut things off, and then we're going to shut things on. I guess I could have said turns on, but <laughs> it's going to shut off beta, gamma, delta. It's going to turn on alpha. This is also going to result in CD4, and if I can fit it down here, CD8 production. So once we have this functional pre-T cell receptor here, um, turning on the alpha especially, but also the CD4 and CD8, this is going to lead us to the process of becoming a double positive. And then let's just also, before we mention that, talk about it. what if by the grace of God the delta gamma recombination wins. If this guy wins, well, then we're going to stop the beta chain recombination. And this guy just goes on and, and just develops just straightly develops to a uh, delta gamma T cell and then goes off to the, the barriers to do its job. No selection needed. It develops and then it goes to the tissue. So for double positive, and that was a hell of a lot that we just went through with that, but for double positive, um, this is kind of characterized by alpha chain competing with gamma delta. We have alpha chain recombination versus gamma delta chain recombination again. So in this, we've already shut these off. But we're going to shut on A. And, but once we reach this point where we start activating A, we are also going to be activating delta. And nine times out of ten, the alpha chain will be successful. If delta gamma wins, I think we know the story here, but I'll just go ahead and draw it out here. If, by the grace of God, delta gamma wins, then we're going to stop recombination at the alpha. Stop alpha recombination, and this guy's just going to go on to the tissue. But for double positive, okay, so we're now we're expressing both the CD4 and the CD8, so we call them double positive for that. Um, the alpha chain wins. When the alpha chain wins, we're going to shut down, um, obviously, rearrangement of this stuff here, and then we're actually going to have delta is going to be removed. Is that thing, the space, in, the segments of that exist but in between the V and J for, for alpha. And just to reiterate that there is many, many ways that we can have or combination things that we can do here because there's so many of those J segments out there. So the next test is to do alpha chain testing. So we've already tested um, to if that the beta chain 
can bind to alpha chains. Now we want to see if it can bind to this particular alpha chain and if this alpha chain is compatible, if it is going to form that disulfide bond with the beta chain, then we're going to move on to selection. And then for single, well, okay, let's just go ahead and so move on. We're going to go the process of selection for both positive and negative. And then after that, after it's the processes of selection that result in the production of single positive T cells.